Hello. Wow, that was impressive. You got quiet fast. Um, hi, I'm Arthur Demrich. Uh, I'm director of the Lemelson Center for the Study of Invention and Innovation. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you tonight. Uh, I, I'm going to give a, immediately a very special welcome to our featured panel, especially Oscar Loretto, Dan Mancina, and Aaron Fotheringham. Thank you for coming tonight. So, so here's what's going to happen tonight. I'm giving a few very brief remarks. Uh, then we'll have a panel discussion. Um, then there'll be some Q&A with you in the audience. Uh, a couple of us will be running around with microphones. So at that point, you know, raise your hand. We'll bring the microphone to you. Um, and then there's a very special capstone to the evening of some artifact uh, donations to the National Collections. And we'll tell you a little about that. So you're gathered here tonight in the very center of the museum's invention and innovation wing. You're surrounded by exhibits of some really amazing historical technologies and examples of the creative impulses that lead to invention. Our exhibits show the successes, the failures, as well as some indication of paths not taken between the invention and the marketed product. Our hands-on invention space that you walk past, Spark Lab, challenges some 230,000 kids a year to invent their own solutions to real world, real world problems. And of course, we all know invention and innovation are the basis of economic growth and prosperity. But more than that, they're very much at the core of the human experience. So creating and sharing new technology and new ways of doing things is fun. It's empowering. And in fact, I would argue it makes us actually quite unique on the planet and almost certainly unique in the universe. So our program tonight brings together several of the major activities of the Lemelson Center. We have a regular Innovative Lives evening program. We run in -a skate festivals, programs where we, in partnership with a number of skate programs, creative and arts organizations and others, hold large festivals that involve skating, teaching kids to skateboard, and then panels somewhat similar to the one you'll see tonight. And we're just in the midst of launching a new Game Changers initiative that will ultimately culminate in a new exhibition, a program that's really about how new technologies give people competitive advantage, that increase accuracy, and above all, that broaden who can participate, play, and compete. So this program is the start of a specific goal to better engage with interesting audiences that include young people, that include people with disabilities. As an institution, we in fact want to learn from you and become a museum and a gathering place for programs like this. So tonight's program highlights athletes as both users and creators of technologies that enhance their daily experience. In the next three months, we have some additional programs along the same theme. So we invite you to join us on March 4th with the three co-inventors of the Jog Bra, on April 1st with Marilyn Hamilton, inventor of the Quickie Wheelchair, a tennis, uh, a wheelchair especially designed to play tennis and compete in tennis. And on May 6th, we're going to feature several Paralympic ski and snowboard legends, including Sarah Will. Um, before I turn over to our panel, I want to call out two people for special thanks. So Josh Friedberg, uh, Friedberg sorry, CEO of USA Skateboarding and really co-creator of the Inna Skate series, and also Beth Zebarth of Access Smithsonian both of whom are really core to making a program like this possible. So the panel, yeah, all right, sure. <laughs> uh, the panel tonight is moderated by two people that I want to introduce at the start, and then they're going to kind of get us going on the panel. So first, Jeff Brody, you want to wave? Um, he's, <laughs> all right. Good crowd, I like it. Um, Deputy Director of the Lemelson Center, uh, he helped create the Inna Skate Festival series in partnership with the skate community and other collaborators, and really a leader of public engagement for the center and the museum. By public engagement, he finds ways to connect people to history and gives voice to audiences that are really core to what we're about as a museum. And then uh, here to my right, waving right now, is Robert Brink, Director of Marketing for USA Skateboard, Robert's a well-known writer, has been published in pretty much every skateboard magazine that exists or has existed, since, of course, occasionally they come and go. Um, he's advised top brands and pros in a variety of action sports and been a writer on feature films. 
uh, has served on the board of directors for Adaptive Action Sports for many years. Um, and you can ask him about this after the panel. He's also a candle maker. Uh, so <laughs> welcome to this panel. Thank you. Thank you. All right, good evening, everyone. I want to echo Arthur's wonderful introduction and just say how much we appreciate all of you being here. I uh, particularly want to thank the panelists who have come from great distance to share their stories with us and give us their insights about their experiences. And I particularly want to echo something Arthur said about the coming together of, of disparate audiences. Um, what I see tonight in the audience and the groups and friends and colleagues that I've met over the years, um, we've met in different ways and different times and engaged in different kinds of programs and activities. And the opportunity through what we're doing now to bring these different groups together in conversation, I find really uh, exciting and wonderful. And so I thank you all for being part of it tonight. Um, we're going to launch in before we have our panelists formally introduce our, uh, themselves. We want to start with an introductory video. Um, and that video is going to highlight some of the uh, Dan, Oscars, and Wheels' skating uh, exploits. These cuts and edits feature Dan ollieing a set of stairs, skating flat ground and ledges at his local indoor skate park, followed by a ledge and stair line out in the streets. Um, we'll also see Oscar skating an indoor mini ramp and doing transitions at an outdoor skate park. And then we'll see Oscar and Wheels together skating a rainbow rail at the Inescape Festival in London from this past May. And then the video is going to conclude with Wheels grinding a spine and dropping off a five foot tall ledge into a quarter pipe at Woodward Park City. Then we'll see Wills doing a front flip at Bob Burnquist's mega ramp, and then a back flip 360 on the Nitro Circus ramp. Just really, you know, small things. Um, and then he's going to perform them right here off of a ramp that we're going to bring out from the back. Um, so in addition to that description the, the, and the brief captions that are in this particular video, um, there is music playing and there are ambient sounds of skateboarding, including the grinding of metal axles and the wood of the deck slamming onto the rails and the ledges, and there's sounds of cheering. And I direct your attention to the two monitors on either, either side of the stage. So if we could have that first video, that would be great. Well, I got this, bro. A real decoration. Okay, so uh, just to launch in more formally, so I'd like each of you please, Oscar, Dan, Wheels, uh, and Rob, uh, introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about where you're from, what you're doing, and uh, to get at it a little bit, I'd also be curious if you would add some insight about 
When you, th when you think back when you were young, what did you want to be when you grew up? <laughs> All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming out. My name is Oscar Laura Jr. Um, I got into skateboarding because I love John Comer, and I saw John Comer skate. He's the first pro skater with prosthetic legs, so that inspired me. Um, naturally, after I saw him, I wanted to be a pro skateboarder. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dan Mancina. Uh, I'm from Michigan. Super stoked to be here. And I think I first wanted to be a firefighter when I was a little kid, but I mean, always a skater, so I got older. So just, you know, dream come true to be able to uh, ride my board for a living. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm Aaron Fotheringham. I'm from Las Vegas. I also wanted to be a firefighter, but <laughs> my mom told me you had to be able to walk to do that. Um, but uh, I always wanted to be a professional action sports athlete. I loved BMX and skateboarding. Um, but life gave me some different wheels, and here we are. <laughs> what about you, Rob? Me? Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Robert Brink. Uh, <laughs> Um, I didn't know I was introducing myself. Um, I'm from New Jersey. I live in California. Um, I wanted to be an archaeologist and dig up dinosaurs when I was a kid. <laughs> Somehow ended up here skateboarding and hanging out with these legends. All right. So, uh, you know, we're here to talk about adaptive technologies in sports, particularly uh, skateboarding and WCMX. You guys should do us a favor and talk about and tell us about and introduce your disability. Um, so I was born, it was a congenital birth defect. When I was in the womb, the amniotic bands wrapped around my uh, hands, preventing the fingers development, uh, and over my left foot. So I basically just have up to the left ankle, but missing my foot. So that's where the prosthesis comes in. And uh, I was born in 86. They didn't have any like 4D ultrasounds or anything like that. So uh, a little surprise to my parents, but um, you know, with right, the proper upbringing and, and mindset instilled in me, like the world was my playground pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. I was born with a hereditary degenerative eye disease called retinitis pigmentosa. Um, pretty much means you slowly lose your vision and deteriorates throughout your life. It's really different for everybody. Um, you know, it can happen faster or slower depending on, on the person. So kind of started losing my main vision or my more functional vision in my mid-20s. And like Oscar, had a really just amazing family that always supported me, so, yep. I was born with spina bifida. Uh, it's a birth defect that, something to do with the development of your spine. Uh, at least that's what I've been told. <laughs> um, I, uh, throughout my life, I've had 23 surgeries, uh, and 20 of them were from the spina bifida. Um, the other ones were just from occupational hazard, um, <laughs> and, and yeah, super, super awesome parents. I was adopted when I was um, a baby, uh, and you know my parents gave me all the love and support I needed. Me? What? So, so let me ask you a question. This is a. Uh, uh, difficult question for me to ask because I don't know how to ask it. Um, and I'm going to try in the spirit of being open and, and having an open conversation. But can you guys talk about to the degree of which your disability and living with your disability is a part of your, your, your identity of who you are? Which ways is that a, a key focus of it? And which ways maybe is it not a focus of your identity and who you are? Is there a moment or a time that you, you, you don't think about it or it doesn't play that type of role in your life? Uh, for me personally, I think it's, it wasn't until entering adulthood <clears throat> that I really, just after, you know, uh, my teenage years that dealing with it. Um, for me growing up, I mean, I had the cliche being picked on last in gym class on teams and traditional sports, although I love traditional sports. It really wasn't until I found skateboarding that there was really no, you know, there was no team needed. There was no, it was just an individual thing to do. And you learn from your peers right away and peers in your skate in the skate park, usually more encouraging, and just the camaraderie factor and community level is there right off the bat, and you sense that right away. Um, so for me, it wasn't until adulthood that I really just embraced my disability and wanted to become an advocate for that community once I learned about it. Because I mean, 
I honestly thought before I saw John Comer, I thought I was the first guy with one leg skateboarding. <laughs> so, um, but until I did, you know, did some research and saw like the history and things like that, that I realized like, okay, this is good to embrace it, to show others that, you know, being different is okay. And you can embrace that and just do what you want. And whether it's skateboarding or anything else that usually is meant for quote unquote able-bodied people, but you're differently able, but you're able to do whatever you put your mind to. Mm. I always felt like disability is one of the few things that, as far as identity, it's forced upon you. So, you know, you can choose to be, you know, dress gothic or ghetto or whatever. You can kind of choose your identity in many ways, but disability is, you know, I, if I want to get around, I have to, I have to you know, use my cane. Um, wheels has to be in a wheelchair. So it's like you're forced to be judged and looked at slightly differently. Um, that definitely was the hardest thing for me to deal with. I definitely always wanted to do the opposite of what people wanted me to do or told me to do, so that's the hardest thing for me to deal with. Sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> Just, the question's about uh, to what extent you know, is, is your disability and your experience, um, in what ways does it, does it play a part in your personal identity? Is there, is there ever, a, you know, is it constant? Does it ebb and flow depending on the situation, the context? Um, well, growing up with spina bifida, I felt like there was a time where I got kind of bummed out on the wheelchair and, you know, having the disability, and then my older brother beat that out of me. <laughs> um, just like, you know, whenever I, you know, kind of feel sorry for myself, he redirected me. Um, but, uh, I feel like usually the only time I struggle with it is when there's like, you know, someone treating me just completely different or yelling at me for taking an escalator or something. Um, but usually that's I only, I only did that twice. I'm not pointing any fingers, but. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're cool. Okay. Um, Dan, you. Of the three up here, you're the one who wasn't born. Um, you were born with vision, mm -hmm. and then it, it, your vision um, degenerated over time. Can you talk about, I guess, just explain that to us as it pertains to this question and being a skateboarder? <clears throat> yeah, um, definitely coming from the sighted world and going into the blind world, uh, you're kind of in a limbo for a little while, especially when you're starting to lose your vision. <clears throat> you don't really, you're not really a part of either world. Um, and I definitely lost my identity for a while um, amongst like everything, like my, felt like my freedom, transportation, everything. Um, and took a, I mean, I think I still, in, in some ways, and am still looking for kind of who I am. Um, but for a while there, like really lost and trying to figure out at first, you know, what is a blind person? What does a blind person do? And then over time realizing really it's, you got to keep focusing on, you know, who's Dan? What does Dan want to do? So learning that, yeah. learning that was kind of like the, the, the breakthrough for me, for sure. Cool. Yeah. Okay, so let's turn to skateboarding and WCMX. So why, uh, Oscar, you began to speak about it a little bit. Why these sports? Why, what attracted to you? Where, how did you find your place? within these activities? Uh, for me, it was just the personal independence, the freedom, like like I mentioned, like not having to, obviously it's gonna be funner to skate with friends, but initially you can start off, you know, in your own backyard, in your driveway, and it's something that's very individualistic and just to you. And then um, for me, like I said, it was just really, it broke the mode for me where traditional sports failed. Skateboarding was there to pick up the pieces for me. And um, I just gravitated towards it. And then once I became, you know, once I dived in head first, like the culture, the lifestyle, the art, everything that's associated. Um, like I work in TV and film now because I associate it, I attribute it to skateboarding because I started off making skate films with my buddies in high school. And then basically, you know, it was like, all right, let me go to college and learn real filmmaking. So for me, it just opened up Pandora's box of everything else. And not only that, like it teaches you life lessons, perseverance, goal setting, determination. And you gotta be a little crazy to slam on concrete and wanna get back up and try it again. So. To me, it was that it checked off all the boxes for me, and I never looked back. Yeah, I'm just—it was different. 
you know, I think we both kind of grew up the same era where it was still wasn't popular, and I just wanted to do anything that, that the average person wasn't doing. I could still wear camo pants and dye my hair blonde and do you know, <laughs> weird stuff like that. And then just, yeah, like, you, you, for me, it was meeting a group full of skaters, too, like, you know, some of my best friends I still have today, and just spending every second together skating and finding spots and something you can express yourself in and, um, yeah, kind of set, set yourself aside from the rest of, of the world, so. For me, I just always loved just watching, you know, Tony Hawk and all the guys just boosting out of half pipes and stuff. It just looked like such a rush. And so um, I tried wheelchair basketball for a little bit. And um, I, and then once I found out, once I had first dropped into a skate park, I was like, oh, I'm totally, you know, switching lanes. And so um, <laughs> just started riding the park and for me it was just like wow like it was never ending like you can drop in somewhere and then you know it's like there's a million different things you can do in a skate park and it just each park you go to is like the next level of a video game what was, what was the first time you dropped in on something how'd that happen uh well the first time i dropped in on a quarter pipe i was like eight years old um it was peer pressured by my older brother. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I swear he's trying to kill me um, because, you know, I was just a little kid, and you know, the first couple were just like face plants and you know falling forward, and then I learned that you gotta like do a wheelie and keep the front wheels up, and rolled away from it and was just hooked. Could you guys just talk about? I know maybe you tapped on into it a little bit, but talk about the skateboarding and action sports communities as far as embracing you you all, whereas maybe I mean, I don't I don't know if traditional sports would have treated you the same way or not. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe they would have. Yeah. Um, I know you if you could just mm -hmm. address that. Um, it's weird. Like, yeah, it's weird. It's hard to articulate, but I mean, it is. There's just some kind of sense of community once you get into the skate park and like find your group of friends to skate. And for me, it was, uh, you could obviously, like if I'm wearing pants, you, it's hard to tell that I have a prosthetic leg, but the first time like I showed up to the skate park and my group of friends in shorts, it was really, I think more where, not that I didn't have their respect already, but they were more stoked that I was actually trying at the, to be at the same level, you know, more advanced skaters were. And the fact that they found out I had a prosthetic leg, I think, either blew their mind or, you know, put in a different perspective for them where they finally was like, they understood like the challenges that I had, but at the same time, they're still very embracing and it wasn't like a pity party or anything like that. It was just like, they were treating me how I wanted to be treated and that felt cool. And it's hard to say, yeah, I mean, maybe if I would have joined, you know, the high school basketball team or soccer team, I may have got the same team camaraderie because of that team aspect of it. But really it was just, the essence of skateboarding that is just, you know, humble and nice from the get-go. And, you know, that's, for me, that's what made me fall in love with it. Yeah. Man, I, yeah, that's a tough question. I mean, I'm just so grateful for to meet people, like, of an older generation who are just legends who, it seems like, always try to just pass on the love for skateboarding to the next generation, like Jim Thebo and... Paul Shire, who've helped me out so much um, and just mean a lot to skateboarding. So it's been nothing but love and support for me. Um, and just really, as a person trying to, like kind of how I mentioned, trying to find myself again and figure out if I can do this, getting that support meant you know everything to me and like really helped even push me further and continues to push me uh, to want to push myself even further than, you know, where I've gone so far, so, I don't know. <clears throat> what, uh, what really hooked me on the parks was really that community slash family feel. Like, I, you know, I felt like when I went to a skate park, you know, my wheels were no different than anyone else's wheels, and just like, I remember growing up, and the skaters just helping me and, you know, pushing me out of the bowl or whatever, it was just, you know, Unreal, that support. 
yeah, the skating mindset is like, <laughs> you're gonna keep, like, if there's if a spot's knobbed or a ledge isn't waxed yet, like, we go out and we do it. Um, there aren't really any barriers that we're not gonna, we're willing to kind of jump over or do whatever we have to do to get it done, so that really translates to all of us riding boards or riding our chairs and the whole culture of, you know, there's nothing that's gonna get in our way, so supports us pretty well. Yeah, and I think, I think Aaron's situation especially, people weren't used to seeing chairs at skate parks, you know. Mm -hmm. It's a skate park for skateboarders and sometimes there's a BMXer or a scooter, but having a wheelchair roll in and everybody's just like, let's, let's, let's figure out how to do this. I think that was one of my favorite things because I'd show up to a skate park and then immediately people are like, whoa, like did this dude escape a hospital? Like what is, what's going on? And, and then you just drop in and people are like, what the? So, yeah, I remember seeing Aaron skate for the first time in a park and I just, I stopped my session. I was like, I was fascinated and wanted to watch him skate and see how he fucking carved the bowl and everything. Like it was gnarly. <laughs> so. One of the things we're studying in the center is, is that is the role and the impact of, of technology and invention in sport. Uh, technologies and, and invention are part of any sport that we all play. They're particularly pronounced, and the impact of technologies in adaptive sports is, is emphasized. So I was, can you share with us the, uh, your, your insight about the technologies that you use that enhance your experiences in skate and WCMX, and how that technologies how those technologies have changed over time, which of those have, been, have had the greatest impact on your skating? Uh, for me, having a prosthetic leg, it was really seeking out the advice of my peers. Like John Comer was the one that I would always break my prosthetic foot on backside tricks, backside flips, backside 180s, anything backside. So it really wasn't until I hung out with him and saw how he would pivot his feet or put his foot placement. And then he just recommended the right foot brand for me, which had, which is a College Park Venture foot, which at the time was innovative because they had put some kind of um, these bushings that mimic ankle movement. And so for me, that was a game changer because then I was able like, to, to sort of mimic doing this or like this for a flip trick. So that in turn basically opened up Pandora's box for me as far as, far as tricks go. And I've been fortunate enough to, to be a part of a lot of skates, uh, uh, learn to skate clinics. And we rigged like a pull on the nose for a kid that had cerebral palsy where he can grab it and jump on the board and balance on himself by himself when he first showed up to the clinic thinking he wasn't going to be able to skate that day. And we, you know, broke the down that barrier. I, um, I don't use a lot of technology. I use, I mean, my cane is my number one tool when I skate. Um, and even like, Really, I use my hands a lot, going down and touching the ledge to really know how high it is and where it's at. Um, you know, I have little, I brought a little beeper, this little box. You flip a switch and it makes a little beeping sound. So using auditory cues to help guide me um, to an object can be useful in certain scenarios. Um, I mean, Getting to a skate spot is always a challenge, uh, not being able to drive. So, you know, your everyday technologies like phones and stuff like that help me uh, in that way. But. Can you explain yeah. how you would use that, um, the beeper? The beeper is good for something that I have to start really far away from. And I have a lot of distance between me and it. So, you know, if I, if I start veering off a little bit, um, you know, compound that over a longer distance, I'm going to be way off by the time I get there. So that helps guide me if I don't have anything else that I can feel like cracks or a, a ledge I can follow, um, like a really open space. So it's like a beacon, you know, like a boat to a lighthouse or something like that. It gives me a, a, a more direct path um, to aim for. So Cool. Yeah. Uh, for me, um, the wheelchair I first like started going to skate parks on, um, it was a brand new chair. It was pretty much just a standard lifestyle chair. And I had, from the time I first dropped in, um, it was about eight or nine months. And then that chair was just destroyed. And, um, and thankfully, I got hooked up with a wheelchair company who decided to take me on and sponsor me. And then, you know, just over the years, you know, because um, wheelchairs are freaking expensive. And 
you know, I, I wouldn't be able to afford the parts. And so to be able to work with this wheelchair company and meet a man named Mike Box who would then tell me that I could go ahead and break the chair and we'll make it stronger. And so um, over the years, we added some cross bracing to the chair and made the frame stronger and then eventually put skateboard wheels on it. And uh, now this chair right here has shocks and stuff on it. So it just kind of just has morphed over the years. and. Now it holds up pretty well. So, so Aaron, you're talking about something that's really important, which is the, the interplay between you as an athlete and as a user and those who are creating and, and building the technologies. And that relationship is really important. Um, so I'm glad you brought it up. But to, I mean, to, to, the, to, to Oscar and you and Dan, um, you know, how do you see your roles as athletes, as leaders in your, your sports, um, in terms of influencing the development of new technologies? What do you see as being the next thing you need, and what are what's your involvement in starting to make those things happen? Um, Eight part question. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a lengthy one. I think in the prosthetic leg. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Sorry. sorry. In the prosthetic leg world, I think um, in other sports and other disciplines, such as like snowboarding, they've made a lot of advancement advancements, uh, especially for above the knee amputees. Where um, a colleague of mine, Mike Schultz, created a moto knee basically for above the knee amputee where you have the knee movement instead of just a stiff, rigid metal pole that doesn't allow you to bend your leg. So I think in those cases, we can emulate that for adaptive skateboarding for uh, people with above knee amputations um, because I know with those clinics that I've been a part of, we've had some AK people and you know it's very difficult for them to skateboard without you know having that kind of flexibility. So I think in, uh, we can take little bits and pieces in collaboration from other disciplines that are making advancements and um, apply it to our sport. For vision impaired and blind, um, more places that are more suitable for skateboarding, you know, parks that have a little bit more sense of you know, a design that's just more accessible for all skaters and riders. Um, I'm sure wheels can speak to that too. Um, and then education, you know, letting parents know that it's okay to let your kids skate if they want to. You know, it's not that crazy or that sketchy. So it's always important. It's kind of always the hardest barrier to get over. And I think uh, what's helped WCMX a lot is just having more manufacturers get into building chairs. Um, there's about three or four people making a skate park chair now. And, you know, each chair has different things about it that kind of helps the sport and helps people get out there and ride. Um, and I think really just everyone being a guinea pig and, you know, going out there and breaking stuff and, you know, it's just kind of helped morph the way the chairs are built now. Do you see yourselves as part of that, that process, that you're an active part of that process in determining what's going to come next? Um, yeah, like I've been, you know, it's been cool to be able to work with Mike Box, who's just like, he'll give me something and be like, go try this. And, you know, I'll go out there and it might last a day and then I come back and I'm like, well, that didn't work, you know, and it's, you know, it's cool because I've had to deal with a lot of frustration and anger with breaking parts and now it's cool that um, kids that are getting into the sport can just get a chair that's going to hold up, you know, and not just break. Um, Dan, when you're talking about a, a park that's more accessible for everyone, I thought that was really key. Can you talk, share some more ideas about what would make what are the features that would make a park more accessible for not just a person with any particular uh, impairment, but for everyone? Right, so the idea of universal design, right? Um, ramps that have a certain grade that uh, someone in a wheelchair can actually get up. Uh, and then rails that have, um, are accessible for wheelchairs as well as any other kind of skating. Um, and visual impairments, I mean, it's important to have objects that are much larger or wider, a quarter pipe that is, can have a lot of room for air. Um, uh, same thing with ledges, long, long ledges that you can kind of take the time to get a reference uh, with and align yourself. Um, and then using anything, any other kind of senses, whether it's uh, good contrast for low vision people, auditory cues like the beeper box, um, and then, I don't know, I'm trying to think of anything for Oscar. I mean, you're pretty, <laughs> you can pretty much skate anything, you know. Um, Beast. Yeah, I mean, just having these Candy things grabs. in in mind during the design of it. Um, and I mean, 
if I could skate it, then you know, pretty much anyone could skate it. So. What do you think would accelerate these changes? What is it, what's it going to take to make these changes happen more quickly? More participants. Yeah. We need to get the next crop of adaptive skateboarders and WCMXers out there. Yeah. I don't think people know how many you know, adapted skaters and riders there are around there. There's a lot. Is it? I'm wondering if you guys ever feel frustrated in the sense that um, I'll just use the example of Danny Way. Like Danny Way was progressing to a level. Um, he was ahead of everybody, so he created bigger ramps, and he created the mega ramp. Do you guys feel held back by the lack of um, innovation and, and progression, be it the equipment or the parks themselves? Like that, there's more you can do. There'd be more you could do if you had a better chair, or there'd be more. You'd be learning more tricks if you had a, a park with the sounds or the ribbons coming from the ceiling, or or more cues for you, or you know, a better prosthetic for you. Do you guys feel that way? Yes and no. I mean, for me personally, it would be rad to have, you know, maybe a robotic prosthetic foot where I could really do a full 360 with my ankle and things like that. And it would probably make flip tricks easier. It might make flip tricks harder. Um, but I mean, in a, it would be in an ideal world, but I mean, in our world, in the real world, I mean, it's just, you gotta, you gotta, you know, play with the cards you're dealt. And, I think it's, uh, it's important to collaborate with the manufacturers and these companies to give them advice for, you know, maybe if it doesn't happen in our time, in the next five, 10 years, 15, 20, whatever, for the next generation, possibly that technology is out. And that would be great. That'd be cool to see. Yeah, I think it's definitely more the, the next generation, especially for me, because I mean, I'm more of a street skater, so I like going out and finding spots. Um, but yeah, the average kid who wants to get into skating, who's visually impaired, uh, won't even really know, you know, kind of where to start, or even have videos that they can reference that have, you know, descriptive audio with it or anything. Um, there's a lot that can be done for visually impaired, for sure, to to uh, encourage the next generation to really want to get into it. And I feel like um, it's also for for people to get a WCMX chair to go to the skate park, it's pretty expensive, you know? It's not just like buying a $100 board or something, you know? It's like, you know, it's kind of hard to come up with that amount of money. And so I think, you know, somehow getting to the point where they're more accessible to get a chair. And then also, you know, I think it'd be sweet to have parks that are just like a little bit more downhill so that we can get more speed to do bigger tricks. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me, uh, before we turn the next set of questions, uh, I want to tee up the next, the second video we like to show you. It's short. Um, so we always tend to focus on the success of technologies to provide enhanced experiences, solve problems. Um, but to get to that point, you have to have a lot of iteration and a lot of examples of failed of technologies that fail and don't achieve what you want it to achieve. So in this next little video clip, we're going to see some examples of technologies that have failed Dan, Oscar, and Wheels. Um, so you're going to see Dan skating and have his cane snap when he's doing tricks. Um, you're going to see the limits of some of the prosthetic technology. Oscar mentioned uh, the prosthetic foot breaking. So you'll see some images of uh, Oscar's uh, mentor and influencer, John Comer, uh, skating and where the prosthetic, uh, the prosthetic breaks. Um, and then you see uh, what happens with Aaron's wheelchair when it doesn't perform to the levels that it needs it to perform to and the wheels crumple and crash. And so in addition to those images, you'll see some of those sounds and types of things of, or what will be featured in the, in the video. So if we could have that second video, that'd be great.
much is a new wheel? <laughs> uh, I don't even, thankfully they helped me out, but I think a set of wheels could be, you know, close to seven to nine hundred dollars. And you, you break them a lot, right? <laughs> yeah, I think they're gonna drop me soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, prosthetic foot's like four to five grand. Ooh. 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 Kane's thirty dollars, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let me, let me turn for a minute. <laughs> it's hard, but let me turn. Um, so within skate culture, um, obviously the, the contests, the competitions are a part and perhaps an important part of skate culture. It's certainly not the only part. Um, things like the X Games, going to the Olympics are certainly highlighting those, those efforts. Um, but now, you know, turning to the Paralympic Games you know, and, and contests, what role do these kinds of contests play in your culture and your experience. So something that's typically not as important within the broader skateboard culture, um, are they important to adaptive skating? I think so because it'll, <clears throat> it'll expand the, uh, the range of the audience and the awareness um, if skateboarding was, let's say, in the Paralympic Games because it would become, not a household thing, but like many unaware people, I would think, would become aware of you know people like ourselves and other adaptive athletes that can skateboard and other sports that, so it'll just open up the Pandora's box for them. Yeah, it's not a bad thing. I mean, it's, you know, you look at in the history of when skateboarding, you know, became popular and really started blowing up back in the 80s. It was all contest skating, so it's, it's a good way to get people looking at it and more people into the sport. Um, like you said, it's definitely not the only way, you know. Um, Especially nowadays, there's just so much. So it's really easy to reach people with media and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I think Paralympics would be would be huge. You know, on an international level like that, uh, can be really helpful and useful. Yeah, I, th I think getting you know adaptive skate and WCMX like on the main stage is just like really what's needed to get that awareness out there to get you know to you know set off more light bulbs for kids that are you know kids and adults that are like you know in the same situation or similar situations that like holy crap like you know I can go out there and send it just like you know anyone else and I think I think that would be huge for both sports so within within this like does organizing a competition for an adaptive skating um, force or breed un necessary categoriz categorization among people with disabilities. And what I mean by that is, how do you decide how to um, judge a competition between athletes who are so inherently and uniquely different from one another? And can you guys speak to your thoughts about that? Well, I think that's kind of the biggest hurdle we have or challenge uh, facing right now, if we want to make that to come to fruition. Um, it all, I think it, go, it roots back to participation numbers. We need more recruitment. Because um, obviously, if it was a contest, Aaron my, and Dan and I versus each other, it would be very difficult to judge it. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, but, I mean, that's the way we've had to do it. So that, we, that's we, what happens now, right? Yeah, we have that. Yeah, I've gone up against these guys, and we've all skated amazing. And you know, the, the placement you know, may differ from what you think you did that day, but that just goes falls back to, for I personally believe, just participation numbers. We need more mm -hmm. people skating. We need, um, and then also like Dan mentioned, just some education on the judges, like just giving them the right criteria. Um, you know, certain disabilities versus this is this disability. I know for sure Aaron can uh, speak more to it, but I know it's different with WCMXers versus you know if you're below the core or above it or, or you know just at the waist and vice versa. So it's a big challenge. Um, we're facing and trying to address right now, but so hopefully we get things uh, cleared out and meshed out and we get it locked down where everybody's pleased and happy. Yeah, I think like any, anything, it's just, it's the first step right now. Um, and it's just a necessary step that we have to go through and learn from and get more numbers and keep pushing and keep going. And I mean, yeah, I think, I think it definitely should be more separate. Um, as far as vision impaired amputee and WCMX, I think are three completely different uh, contests to be judged. Uh, but yeah. 
Yeah, I agree with these guys. Um, just like a big part of it, part of its numbers, and then you know, even just in WCMX, like Oscar said, it's like you know, uh, someone that's a higher injury level rather than someone that's lower. You know, it causes a little bit of confusion and some a little bit of struggle when it comes to judging and stuff. So it's tricky, especially judges that might not be as familiar with what it's actually like to be that, you know, have that disability. Um, that's a whole other thing, a whole other education in itself. Yeah, and you're, you're invited to adaptive and obviously WCMX where these guys are only competing in adaptive contests, not both categories, right? Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. get twice yeah. the amount of trophies. Fuck. I mean, to me, it's, it's rare that there's WCMX in that terminology, but I mean, it's still skateboarding in a chair to me. And I think, mm -hmm. I mean, like I said, we've said initially the con, the first adaptive contest that sprung up, we all skated against each other and it's fun, but it's just, yeah, mm -hmm. it's just something that boils back down to participation numbers. And, you know, maybe then one day, like, then, like I said, if we get the next crop going, then us three can be judges and we'll know, you know how to judge it properly. <laughs> yeah. you know, if you look into the future, can you ever imagine a point at which the technology and the innovation and the inventions for adaptive skating ever go too far? Like they'll ever make the competition sort of obsolete? It's gonna be all about the, t to where it becomes about the technology and who, how, who has access to the technology versus the athletic uh, ability? That's a tricky one. I don't know. I think maybe in WCMX, if they had all the rails fit the chair and then making it, you know, taking away that balance factor, which essentially is part of the trick, that might be some like an example. Um, as far as maybe like a robotic prosthetic leg might be unfair to somebody right. like myself or also depends like residual limb loss. Some could be longer, some could be shorter. So that plays an advantage and disadvantage as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question as far as at the Olympic level, because there's been Olympic athletes who have taken, had their medals taken away, right, from running. Mm -hmm. um, at what point is it an advantage? Um, I don't think we have to worry about that with vision loss, though. I mean, it's, pre <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. it's pretty much a disadvantage. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, when I pull up the third and our final video tonight, and this, this video clip features Oscar, Dan, and Aaron uh, interviews and comments that were conducted during the, the recent USA Skateboarding Toyota National Championships in Vista, California, October 20th, 2019. And this was the first time that adaptive street skateboarding event was included as part of the national championship competition. So the vid video includes footage of men and women skating at the indoor skate park using prosthetics, canes, wheelchairs, and other technologies to perform a variety of jumps, flips, and grinds while navigating the array of ramps, quarter pipes, ledges, rails, and stair sets. Um, the athletes are being watched by their fellow skaters and by a large audience. And the video cuts in between the competition and comments from Oscar, Dan, and Aaron who discuss this question and, and this issue of the emergence and popularity of adaptive skateboarding in WCMX, the importance and excitement of bringing skateboarding to the Paralympic Games, and the importance of adaptive skateboarding and WCMX to the athletes and to the skate community as a whole. So if we could see that last video. Being a member of the adaptive skate community, or the adaptive community in general, like we've hit uh, certain strides and milestones like within the past decade of there's more adaptive athletes. It's becoming more accepted and I think whether you're a wounded warrior or you're born that way, sports are something that can help you get you out of that rut. And then skateboarding especially is, I think, the best tool of that. And it's rad to see the growth, like especially in the influx in women's skateboarding, you know, that trickles down to the adaptive uh, community. And then WCMX, I like, guess, is, is skateboarding in, in a wheelchair, which is gnarly. So that has a lot of potential and room for growth. So when I first started riding WCMX, there was like, you know, not many people out in parks riding. Uh, their chairs and stuff like over the last few years like just recently to see like the growth of the sport and to see you know companies getting more like involved it's cool to just like see it grow kind of first started skating again as a vision impaired skater wasn't sure if how many people were out there you know who actually did it and then like seeing one or two 
And then the more exposure I got, people reaching out like on social media and then like realizing like there's people all over the world who are not only visually impaired, but like you said, you know, people like Og from back in the day and like Justin Bishop, another blind skater. And, just like I never knew anything about WCMX or anything either. So seeing the level those guys are riding at too is like crazy. And it, to me, yeah, it feels like it's it's definitely growing. Seeing adaptive skateboarding and the WCMX and the Paralympics would mean a lot to me. It'd mean that the hard work I've done paid off, like the advocating and the awareness with various nonprofit organizations. It means that people with disabilities are accepted in skateboarding where traditional sports it's not that normal and in the Paralympic would be like the icing on the cake and just the, the pinnacle of everything. We need contests like this to showcase exactly what we need as adapted skaters from the course to the judging to everything like this is just one more step and a very necessary step. For me it really is just a dream come true to be able to compete in an event like this and to have a chance at bringing WCMX to the Paralympics. When I first started riding, you know, when I was eight, it was always a dream to have, you know, the competitions grow and to be able to see it morph and evolve and get closer is it's freaking awesome. So that's the beauty of skateboarding is that where traditional sports failed me in my story, like skateboarding was there to to go to the park and try something new and not get made fun of or not, you know, I didn't have to get picked last or be ostracized because I couldn't hold a baseball bat right. So skateboarding is just the fundamental key to teach you life lessons and it's just a beautiful thing to see it grow and like, and helps you for, with every facet of life. Let me just put out one last question to y'all before we get to Q&A from the audience and, and you know you are all now role models in your own ways what actions would you like people to do as a result of learning about you and your stories uh, I mean with the the world we live in today social media and sharing stories is great I'm always keen on challenging the industry the skate industry and companies um, I mean these two to my left are doing a great job in breaking the mold on that by making a living from skateboarding, but I always challenge companies to, to um, make an adaptive skater pro, given the same income, same opportunities, the same touring, same contest opportunities that, you know, Nigel and the, all the pros have. So that's my big thing is just, uh, you know, if I could see that happen as I get older for the next generation, that'd be, you know, satisfying for me. What's the, what's the question? <laughs> How would you like to inspire others oh. to take action? And do whatever, whatever it is you want to do, just, just do it, you know? Uh, I had advice from a doctor way back when I asked him when I started losing my vision, you know, what, what is a blind, what can I do? And he said, whatever you want to do. <laughs> and that really is, you know, the best thing you can do. Yeah. I think a lot of the time, you know, we get into situations like, you know, spina bifida, <laughs> or you're just born into it, or, um, you know, retinous pigmentosa. Um, I hope I said that right. But I think, you know, just important to focus on all the things we still have, like all the assets that we have in life. And, mm. you know, whether it's a wheelchair or a cane, you know, there's things around us to help us, you know, succeed and chase our dreams. And I think it's just really important to get the word out there, um, let people know that these sports exist and that it's possible. And, yeah. Awesome. Right, this is fantastic. I want to turn um, and ask my colleagues who uh, have microphones. If you have a question you'd like to ask, raise your hand and they will bring you a microphone. Hi, uh, hi everybody. This has been such an amazing outward expression of your, your abilities and sharing that with us. One of the questions that came to mind the whole uh, this whole time as you've been sharing your experience going through you know three different totally different sports even though there's some commonalities or different sports to each each person is what some of the innovative technology and I use that loosely but that's happening on the inside every morning that you wake up and you're like I got to do this again I get to do this again and how are you how are you navigating some of those conversations with yourself that maybe you're not sharing with, with the crowd, if you, if you wouldn't be so kind to share some of that language with us. 
deep. <laughs> um, for me personally, I mean, my biggest hurdle was in my teenage years dealing, you know, I'd always walk around with my hands in my pocket, always wearing pants, never wear shorts. So for me, going through, through that and getting over that intimidation factor of the stairs and, you know, maybe some murmurs and the gawking <laughs> stairs, but I mean, it's just realizing that you know, we like I said, we got the we were dealt the hand that we were dealt. We're playing those cards to the best of our ability, and it's just grateful and cool to see that it's resonating amongst communities, especially the skateboarding community, that people are taking notice of what we're doing and using it in turn to inspire others and to inspire themselves. So, for me, I mean, I do the same thing you do. I assume I just wake up every morning, brush my teeth, get ready, and just go handle the day. And you know, whatever challenges come at it, whether it's personal ability or you know whatever else emotional anything else you got to go in your life you just got to be grateful that you're here on this earth and you're living life to the fullest mm -hmm. man I'm extremely self-conscious about my sight loss and navigating by myself in public uh, still <laughs> is not fun for me to do um, I mean I've only been totally blind for you know eight months, close to a year now. Um, so it's, it's tough, it's not, it's not fun every day for sure, but skateboarding has given me a way to like kind of gain a little bit more control back and show people um, who I am in a way that I want to be viewed. Um, but yeah, it's not, not always fun and definitely, definitely wears on me for sure. <clears throat> I feel like for me, uh, just, Growing up with spina bifida and, you know, using the chair all the time, um, you know, I had all the surgeries and all, all that kind of stuff, like, related to the actual, like, physical disability. And I was, like, I never felt like, for some reason, I felt like this wasn't my problem, <laughs> you know. It's all the insecurities and the struggles and, like, the trying to find the motivation, like, in my head, you know. And um, I feel like what's helped me is just, like, finding that one thing in a pile of crap to be grateful for, you know, and like, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but uh, yeah, just, you know, you know, instead of being bummed on the chair, so I'm just like seeing it as a tool to help me, you know, kind of get things done. Yeah, just keep pushing. Keep pushing. Yeah, I like to quote, uh, Comer had this great quote in the article when they asked him about his disability, and um, I mean, I'll tone it down for the crowd, but it was, stuff happens, get over it. <laughs> 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 so. I've taken that motto as my own, you know, mantra, and like, it's paid off so far and worked. Hello, um, my name is Katie. I am. I live in D.C. I missed wheelchair D.C. 2020, so that's why I'm wearing the crown. Oh no way! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, but my platform is disability positivity and acceptance in schools and I'm a teacher I teach immigrants and refugees English and I did a lot of adaptive sports growing up so um, I think I would love to try it, skateboarding but um, I also have some students who have because I have spina bifida also so I have some students little girls who also have spina bifida and um, they are awesome, but I don't think they realize, which I didn't at probably eight years old either, um, realize all the adaptive sports that they could do. So, And their classmates are wonderful too, but I don't think they really understand it. So how would you maybe recommend that they kind of learn about this sort of world, not just the kids with disabilities, but all of the kids, so it's, it's new, to, it's not just like, something foreign to them, and when they grow up, they're not ignorant of disabled people. Sorry, that was a lot. <laughs> um, I think we're starting to see the inclusion as, you know, uh, trickling down, like, um, kid stories that are including characters in wheelchairs or amputees. Um, I think, you know, Mattel introduced Barbies that have, you know, disabilities. So I think just exposing them to that, um, and then just showing them the adaptive community world, and then saying, like, oh, look at this, isn't this cool, and then maybe that would spark interest in one of your students and saying like, oh, I want to try that or, you know, because there's not just skateboarding, there's adaptive rock climbing, there's adaptive track and field, there's so much stuff. Oh, yeah. And then, um, awesome. yeah, it's awesome. So I think it was just, uh, just the exposure, I think, at mm -hmm. a young age they would need that just to know that it, it is possible. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask, um, is there anybody in the audience who's from one of the local 
local but national adaptive sports organizations and communities work with those organizations. So those people are in the room. Yeah. yeah. Um, so awesome. I would encourage those people. I will talk to you. <laughs> yeah. And help all of us understand how we can get more information about these organiza organizations. That'd yeah. be really helpful. Yeah. I think more introduction in the schools themselves, you know, yeah. where that's the majority of the kids are going through school um, and having sports for everybody and introducing them to, you know, skateboarding, everything. Um, I know for visually impaired, a lot of it's technology, accessibility, um, even having access to an article or a document or a video yeah. or anything uh, is a barrier in itself. Absolutely. Um, I have a question for Aaron. I was going to ask if, how did you like first time on your wheels that it was like, how hard was it? Um, the first time in a skate park or just in general? Um, in general? In general? Um, well, for me, at the beginning of my life, I used crutches a lot, and then um, they just became a lot, you know, a lot more painful for me, and it was really slow. So I, I started using a wheelchair full time at like eight, and to me, it was just so much fun because I could, you know, keep up with my friends and doorbell ditch and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Two questions. Left. Hi, so I have a question for Dan. Um, I know you skated before you lost your vision, so you know personally how particular skateboarders are with the size of their boards. Are you as particular, less particular, or more particular about your cane size? Ooh. Ah. <laughs> Interesting. It's just as particular, yeah, 54 inches for standard skating. If I'm skating a gap, it's going to be 58 inches. Um, and, yep, yeah, you got it. It's just like shoes or a board. It takes about a good, you know, th about three days to break it in. It's, like, super weird and awkward at first. Um, and, yeah, especially even the tip that I use has to be a specific tip. Um, yeah, it's just as particular for sure. One more in the front. Hi. Um, I wanted to say thank you, first of all, for all you're doing to pass it down to the next generations. But what is your greatest success? Like, even you were like, oh, wow, I just did that. Great question. Hmm. Skateboarding is never ending, right? It's just every day. Try to, try to, we're all trying to chase that feeling of, yeah, the next goal or the next trick or whatever it is. That's how it is for me. Um, I'm always super stoked after finishing a, like a full length video part. Um, always super proud of that. But, yeah. For me, I think it was getting sponsored and being recognized for my talents and not because of my disability. So that was pretty rad. I think for me, it was in one of the videos where I was able to land a backflip 360. It was. <laughs> It was just one of those tricks that like always sounded cool, but it felt impossible. And then uh, I ended up getting it like third try and almost crapped my pants. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I think, that, I think that was a great question to end the conversation on. But what I'd like to do in the concluding part of the program, invite my colleague uh, Jane Rogers, who's a curator in the museum's sports history collection. So tonight, um, we're really very honored that Oscar, Dan, and Wheels are all donating objects to the National Collections. And Jane's going to talk about that and the objects. And <clears throat> you doing? OK. Hi, I'm short. Sorry. Uh, hey, um, as Jeff said, I'm a curator with the Sports Collection, and I really like to collect extreme and adaptive sports. I do collect other sports, but that's my you know, favorite thing to do. Um, I've been act actively collecting from adaptive athletes for the last five years, and I'm always blown away by the positive attitudes most of them possess and the desire to be considered an athlete above all else. This positivity corresponds with the museum's mission to collect sports artifacts 
representing national values such as competition, endurance, hard work, and team spirit, which are all personified through America's devotion to sports. The National Sports Collection protects and preserves America's unique sporting legacy, exemplified through our nation's rich heritage of amateur and professional competition, illustrated through objects that celebrate the lives of athletes, fans, inventors, and icons alike. The sports collection includes over 10,000 objects, ranging from clothing and equipment to patent models and medals, from posters and programs to trophies and ticket booths. Artifacts as old as a 510 BC amphora to the latest achievements in technology are preserved here in perpetuity. Athletics on all levels are collected, conserved, studied, and shared with our millions of visitors each year. Our skate collection explores the history of skateboarding and its tremendous impact on our global culture through technolo technological innovation, fashion, media, music, art, politics, and the skate lifestyle. And while the collection began in 1987 with the acquisition of a Pal Peralta Quicksilver board, the museum's collecting initiative for skateboarding really took off with the addition of a Tony Hawk board in 2011. Two years later, the Lemelson Center brought us in a skate, and since then, the skate collections have grown from 40 objects to over 400. At the same time the skate collections were expanding, I had the opportunity to collect objects from pioneering wheelchair basketball athlete Ray Werner, who had been paralyzed during World War II, and he used basketball as part of his rehabilitation. Warner considered himself an athlete first, despite his limited physical ability, which I quickly realized is a theme throughout the adaptive sports community. While our adaptive sports collections are only uh, maybe 40 objects strong, they are a wonderful cross-section of sports, representing both recreational and competitive athletes, from the X Games to the Paralympics, with handmade gear put together from parts bought at Home Depot to advanced prosthetics. I'm honored to collect the objects which are located on the tables over there to my right, um, from these innovative athletes who are changing perceptions with each competition, world record, or simply by pushing down the street. Um, so I'm gonna tell you guys which each athlete donated and then I'm gonna walk over and have them sign these deeds of gift to make the donation, donation official. So Oscar is donating um, a prosthetic leg, a skate deck, and a pair of van shoes worn during the 2019 Summer X Games and throughout most of his skating career till he was, what, 25, you said, for the prosthetic. Um, Dan is donating a skate deck um, where he rolled up a sticker, put it under the grip tape so that he could orient um, himself to the board while skating, and also a folding cane so he could feel out the obstacles and the terrains as you saw in the videos. Um, and Aaron is donating the wheelchair specifically designed for big ramp jumps he used in over 40 performances with the Nitro Circus and during the 2016 Paralympics in Rio. Um, so I'm going to walk these over. for your continuing drive for excellence in athletics and for your dedication to expanding the role of adapt athletes throughout the sports world. And so now the uh, objects are officially in the division's collections and um, hopefully they're going on exhibit soon, maybe? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, so with that, we're gonna bring the program to a close. I wanna thank uh, Josh Freeberg. There you go. And Rob Brink from USA Skateboarding for all they did and their partnership with us over the many years and bringing these kinds of programs together. I want to thank uh, you know, my colleagues in the Lemelson Center uh, for organizing this material, the folks in the SI Accessibility Office for giving us guidance and support uh, in, in exploring these, these topics in history. Um, and everyone, all of you for being here and contributing to tonight's discussion. 
and mostly to Dan, Oscar, and Wheels. Guys, thank you so much. I mean, it's amazing. And let's just pledge to continue the conversation and continue the exploration together. Thank you, and good night.